Welcome in to the Sports Buffoons Podcast. This is Mike Settle. I am rolling solo today, but I've got some things we need to discuss. Uh, first and foremost, Chiefs. What is going on with our tickets? Our ticket prices they were $140 last year, now jumping up to 480 for the Texans game in two weeks from Thursday. Uh, I understand they're doing the best they can to thrive during these times, and their whole idea is, well, we're down to 22% capacity, so let's just jack the prices up four times the price of normal seats. Uh, and it might work to a degree, but my main thing is not so much what the Chiefs are doing, but you as a fan, what is the appeal in even going to a game this year at this point? Uh, we already know we're having a, you know everything going on with the headdresses being banned, any kind of Native American face paint is now banned. You're no longer to have those kind of things going on. We're already going to have plenty of distancing within the stadium, I assume. And, you know, the entire atmosphere of Arrowhead is not going to be up to par of what we love and know as fans anyway, as, as it is. So if you're going to want to go to a game or go to this Texans game here week one coming up, um, is it just to celebrate the raising of the banner, the raising of the Super Bowl 54 banner? Uh, is it really worth it to you for 480 or even more for a seat in the corner? Um, that's that's up to you to decide. But from my perspective anyway, I don't feel like there's a whole lot of appeal to wanting to go to a game right now. The tailgating is going to be different. The whole atmosphere is going to be different. They're already talking about figuring out a way to kind of maneuver around getting rid of the tomahawk chop or at least the antics and sounds within the stadium. That way it's not encouraged any longer which is very interesting to me considering the fact the Chiefs just put in a drum deck just a couple years ago, and it actually the drum was actually used before that. Um, but just a couple years, of the, years ago, they put in a drum deck, and that drum deck was something that they actually wanted to encourage the fans pregame to do a tomahawk chop, get, get everyone you know, crazy, come together as one, as a, as a fan base, and you know, get their team pumped up and ready to roll for the game. And it's an amazing thing. I, th I thought that the uh, the drum deck was a great great touch and great addition to Arrowhead Stadium, moving it from what was originally on the field and then moving it up to a corner, kind of you know postered up by itself off to a side. And we bring in celebrities, Eric Stone Street, and many others have come around and banged the drum at some point. And Andy Reid even banged the drum after the parade. These are all things that promote the Tomahawk Chop. So what are we going to do with that area now? And these are things that they just put into place. So why is it all of a sudden now we're making a big deal out of this? Uh, I mean, when the Tomahawk Chop was first heard in 1991 when the Northwest Missouri State Band was directed by the Florida State alum uh, Al Sergil to uh, perform the chant while players warmed up for a game against the Chargers. Uh, so, I mean, obviously this is something that we've adopted and kind of stolen from the Florida State Seminoles. And then the Braves then later adopted it once they got Deion Sanders on their team. And whenever Deion Sanders would come up to at bat, they would start a tomahawk chop as well. And it just fit. It just fit for what they were going for and the look of their team and the Braves. So after that, you know, the Chiefs then adopted it fittingly, and it makes sense. Um, but I don't care about the headdress thing. I don't care about the face paint thing. Those are fine. If you want to ban them, that's fine. But the entire atmosphere of Arrowhead Stadium this year in 2020 is not going to be the atmosphere that we know and love, that we've always you know, been a part of and wanted to pay good money to go do and be involved in that atmosphere. First of all, you're not going to help crowd noise wise. So you're, you know, we used to, we're the loudest stadium in the NFL. And at this point, they're going to be piping in crowd noise to help out, but that's going to be going on around the entire National Football League, not just at Arrowhead Stadium. So the 22%, which roughly comes out to 16,800 fans, that's not really going to amount to much. I mean, there's high school games in Texas that hold more than that. So uh, it's just one of those deals where I don't really know if it's worth it to go to a game. Uh, if you can give me a good reason to, then go for it. If you want to pay that money, then go for it. That is totally your choice at that point. Um, now, another thing I want to discuss real quick, Peter King had visited uh, the Chiefs practice here recently. The past, it was yesterday, as a matter of fact. And he had an article come out about some of the performance of an activity of Clyde Edwards Alaire, the running back from LSU, who has been basically forced into a starting role. But let's be honest, he was going to get a lot of touches anyway, regardless. Um, and he had a lot of good things to say. We've apparently been running a lot of stretch runs 
which is something slightly different from what we've done in the past as far as our running game is concerned. And uh, one thing that kind of did stand out to me, though, as far as going back to some of the discussion we just had about headdresses and you know face paint and the name Chiefs and stuff like that, he did mention at the end of his article here uh, that he's considering no longer calling the Chiefs Chiefs in his articles. He's just going to call us KC. So, I mean, we're going down that path. At what point are we satisfied? At what point is it going to be enough to where we can live our lives and not be concerned about such a politically correct nature, especially with middle school things like the name Chiefs, which is not derogatory whatsoever. We can talk about Redskins, obviously, and the issues going on with that. That is totally fine. It's a totally different subject of uh, what they had going on over there in Washington. Just let me go ahead and read off to you what Peter King states in his article about the name Chiefs and his future usage of it anyway. I think I appreciate Kansas City owner Clark Hunt and the president Mark Donovan doing a deep dive into all aspects of their team name. No more headdresses at home games, no more face paint with native themes, and a review of the tomahawk chop or arrowhead chop, and the accompanying singy songy oh, oh, oh from the fans. This nickname is tricky to me. Chiefs is more honorific than Washington's band name, but it's still a nickname and a mascot, which so many Native Americans oppose. I'm considering not using the Casey nickname in my writing either, thinking about it. Well, I mean, the, first of all, our mascot is a wolf. It's nothing to do with uh, Native Americans. So that party, I don't know what he's, what he's trying to discuss on that end of it. But as far as for what Peter King is talking about here, it's like, okay, we're coming from a national spotlight. Everyone knows who Peter King is. He's done work, you know, obviously, with, with uh, Sports Illustrated and Pro Football Talk, things of big nature. And... We're at the point where, you know, is the name Chiefs really going to be at some point in the next five years removed? Is it really offensive? I don't know. That's debatable. And um, not to mention the name Chiefs also originally didn't have anything to do with Native American nature. It, it came from the mayor of Kansas City at the time, Roe Bartle, which was nicknamed the Chief, which was best friends with Lamar Hunt at the time. Uh, so I don't know. I just I think we're getting a little a bit off the grid when it comes to those kind of things and a little bit ticky tacky when it comes to uh, our verbiage when we've already done plenty to help appease anyone who does have a problem with uh, the Chiefs language or the Chiefs nature and everything we represent as a fan base and the team itself. They themselves, you know, they've, they've done many things involving themselves with the Native American uh, nature and getting uh, tribes themselves to come to the games even in 2014, the Chiefs, you know, drum was blessed by Moses Starr Jr., a spiritual leader of the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes from Concho, Oklahoma. Uh, we've done everything in our power to make sure every, the Native Americans do feel comfortable with having that name attached with Kansas City and also doing it in a very respectful way. Uh, we've had moments in the past that I would say are a little bit sketchy. Back in the 1990s, we used to have football trading cards with Derek Thomas and many other players on the team back then wearing headdresses and full-on war paint and, uh, you know, dressed up in some kind of Native American attire. And, uh, you know, at the time, I don't think it was really thought of too much in any kind of light. But then again, we didn't have social media to really blow things up and make an issue out of something. And if things were talked about, they were done very silently and never got across to the <clears throat> average public. So... Luckily, we're not at least at that point anymore. Uh, I can at least appreciate that. But as far as talking about the name Chiefs, look, we already got rid of the Redskins. Let's leave the Chiefs alone. And as far as the Tomahawk Chop thing goes, uh, I think that that's one of those deals where the fans are going to do it regardless. I don't care if there's a drum banging or if they don't want to play the audio over the speakers in the stadium. The fans are going to pick it up at any moment and start Tomahawk Chopping because... I mean, that's, that's just what we do, and I don't think anyone looks at it as a derogatory type of statement from the team. But getting back to the original article here on Peter King's uh, mention here from Pro Football Talk, um, he was just kind of talking about the, the draft of Clyde Edwards Hilaire in the first round. He's, he says, take him in the first round, believe him, this in your fantasy draft, that is, take him in the first round. Um, he is going to be getting plenty of touches, especially with Damian Williams Going ahead, and going ahead and opting out for the 2020 season uh, to stay at home with his mom or to at least keep his mother safe from any kind of illness with coronavirus going on. Um, 
and it's just a you know it's right now it looks like the team has come together with the pieces we need we're obviously in a position where the majority of our entire team i think it's something like 19 of our 22 starters are returning might be 18 actually now that we had a uh, Damien Williams opt out uh, on the, the the past 26 non kneel down possessions of the 2019 postseason, Mahomes drove to score 16 touchdowns and two field goals. That's 117 points in 11 quarters. Uh, that would eventually equal out to about 39 points per game, and that was doing that against some really couple of really good defenses with uh, the, obviously the 49ers in the Super Bowl and the Tennessee Titans, which was a pretty decent defense at times. Uh, yeah, Texans obviously are have their own issues over there, so uh, that's a different situation. But uh, obviously, we're on the right path as far as coming into this year, and, it, and it's a, it's one of those situations where teams don't often repeat. You don't see that happen in the NFL very often at all. In fact, the the last time that both the teams from the AFC and NFC respectively uh, won their divisions the following year was the 2013 Seahawks and Broncos. And that was also the first time since 1996 that both Super Bowl participants won their division the following year. So it doesn't happen very often. And <clears throat> when we look at the NFC, we look at the NFC West where the 49ers lay out, they're obviously the team with a more difficult division than the Chiefs reside in. So the Chiefs have, have run this division. It's been honestly a little bit too easy. Our record against the AFC West since 2015 is 27 and 3. That's just ridiculous. I mean, I don't know, even if uh, Bill Belichick and the Patriots have been that successful uh, in their back in their heyday of their little dynasty. So um, it's one of those, the only game we even lost to, uh, or with Patrick Mahomes, that is, was with the uh, Mike Williams corner of the end zone catch that uh, was kind of a push off situation that went uncalled back in 2018 so that was one that kind of stands out and of course the uh, there was a Raiders game uh, three years ago I believe that was obviously another tacky situation where uh, I think there was just some calls that probably did not go in the Chiefs favor and that happens you're not going to be able to go 30 and 0 against your own division I don't care how bad you are how bad your division is there's going to be games where things happen and people slip up and mistakes are made and there's fumbles and so on all right, to wrap it up here on episode one of our Sports Buffoons podcast, I do have a hot take of the week. And my hot take of the week in regards to the entire NFL. I'm going to do this at least weekly. Maybe you'll catch me on a fantasy day when we're talking about our fantasy football standings and mock drafts and all the other great stuff about the sports world. But my big take is that I think that Phillip Rivers with the Colts is going to have a career year. I think Philip Rivers, for the first time since 2009, has a season, a full season that is, with less than double-digit interceptions and more than 30 touchdown passes. And I think he's in the perfect situation. He's with a, a better structured team than what the Chargers were giving him at the time. And they've just always, the Chargers have always been inconsistent. They've just, they've been a team that's in the past had lots of talent, but always just underperformed of what they, where they needed to be at. And Rivers has gone through times with that team where his offensive line was awful. He's constantly losing his left tackle, right tackle. They're always down with injuries. That whole team gets riddled with injuries. Keenan Allen would get hurt randomly. Antonio Gates was always hurt. They just always had problems going on. I mean, the running back situation, obviously, stuff like that. Rivers was always the one constant piece. You're talking about a guy who finished and played in an entire playoff game with a torn ACL, and no one even knew it. I mean, the guy's just a absolute warrior and you know we can talk about how he's been a crybaby sometimes and all this kind of stuff and that's fine he's but he's not jay cutler he's not over there pouting and you know whining and bitching about you know things this way or that way rivers just goes out there does his best to game but he's passionate he's passionate about winning he wants to win he, he's a gamer the guy's never gonna quit um so i just i, I admire that about him as much as people want to bash him but I think when you talk about him going to Indianapolis and they have a really good running game, they just drafted Jonathan Taylor out of Wisconsin, and as well as add on with Marlon Mack in the backfield, having a consistent running game, which looks to me like it's going to be power football, which is something Rivers is not used to. Rivers is used to going back there and having to sling it in a shotgun, you know, 40 times a game. And they're just, you know, Austin Eckler and guys like that have always been catching lots of passes. 
So he's in a situation now where I think they're going to be relying a little bit more on a power game as far as running the football, getting it consistent that way, then being able to hit you over the top or downfield with some of the deep passing game that Rivers has traditionally been pretty good at. And he's got good receivers too because T.Y. Hilton, I mean, that guy's one of the better receivers in the league. He's consistent year in, year out. Uh, doesn't get injured too often, so he doesn't have much of a history in that regard. And he's just got good players around him. I think he's going to make Michael Pittman Jr., the rookie, look really good. I think the, the, the size in that guy, it was going to be very similar to what Mike Williams was with the Chargers. But Pittman Jr. is going to be a little bit faster, a little bit more of a downfield threat to where I think we're going to see him, even as a rookie, step up right away and make some big plays for the Colts. Uh, I think Rivers, with that offensive line, is going to be so great. I think that you got you got Anthony Costanzo, Quentin Nelson on the left side over there. And he's finally going to be protected for the first time in a long time and be able to have time to, you know, get the ball off. So I'm expecting a big year from Phillip Rivers. I'm looking somewhere, you know, over over 4,000 yards passing, 30 touchdown passes, and less than 10 interceptions for Phillip Rivers on the season. All right, guys, starting next week, let's hope to get our boys Tanner Dawson and Jason Grayson over here to the Buffoons podcast show. And that way us as a group can all get together and you know, be buffoons. That's what we're really good at. So we're going to keep bringing it to you that way as time goes on. As I said, my name is Mike Settle. My Twitter handle is Casey Rockaholic. We do not follow me on there. I say a lot of dumb shit. So let's just avoid that one and stick with following us at Sports Buffoons on Twitter. I will get back with you guys this weekend as we get back into some fantasy football talk. And we're going to have a full mock draft. Uh, my league particularly starts here September 5th as my day of my draft. So uh, I'm sure you guys are planning around the same time, so let's keep this rolling, and I will see you guys on the next one.